Every figure in the crush set has a story. Christmas Eve, I like to tell the scripture story by pointing to the different figures and ask the children who are here to identify the person and what they're doing and like why is the shepherd on his knees and why are people in this way and where's Jesus and all this. And uh, the figures mean a lot to us and we're very familiar with them. Everybody has an important part to play. But to me, the most underrated player is Joseph. We wouldn't have the stable scene without him. But his most important work is usually overlooked. He was probably the kind of man that liked to work behind the scenes quietly but effectively. He gets Mary safely to Bethlehem. And when Herod starts to murder the children in the hopes of insanely wiping out the Holy Child, Jesus takes his family to Egypt and they hide out there until things cool off and it's safe to come back home. Joseph doesn't say a word that is recorded in Scripture. He doesn't leave us a Magnificat like Mary or um, even hymns of praise. You know, we don't hear about him saying or singing anything like the shepherds did. But maybe he didn't have to because he spoke very clearly through his actions. We all need a Joseph in our lives. It doesn't have to be a man. Just someone who loves us, protects us, takes risks for us, never abandons us. It's a consistent presence, someone we know we can turn to, especially when times are tough. But he's also a prime example of someone who knows the difference between a bad dream and a message from God Almighty. More about that later. Sometimes we are horrified when we hear some of the punishments and practices inflicted by other cultures. You will remember years ago now, a young man from this country was caught with drugs on him, and I forget the country in the Middle East, but he was caned, 30 lashes, which is a pretty brutal punishment, but it was mild considering what they wanted to do. He got off easy. Or a hand is cut off for stealing. Or a woman is stoned to death for committing adultery. Sometimes a young woman will even be punished severely if she's been the victim of a rape, which makes no sense. She had nothing to say or do about it. She's a victim too. But now she's seen by her family as damaged goods. She cannot be married and become a functioning part of her own culture because no man in her clan will want her. She's an embarrassment to the family. Usually it is her father or her brothers who carry out the punishment, which is often severe. These practices make us angry and strike us as inhuman. But they are not new inventions by extremist groups like the Taliban. No, they have deep and ancient roots and are often backed up by the law. And in other words, the people that perpetrate these responses believe that they are carrying out the will of God. It's awfully hard to argue or dialogue with someone who is so convinced that they're doing the will of God when to us or me, we're so convinced that they're doing just the opposite. Anyone who lived in the time of Mary and Joseph understood these rules all too well. That's why there's no explanation of it. When it just casually mentioned that Joseph didn't want to um, submit her to public disgrace. Disgrace covered a lot of territory. After she publicly humiliated him, they would have been absolutely astounded, the people, that Joseph would forgive her and take her to be his wife. What was he thinking? We, on the other hand, tend to admire him for being so kind, so trusting, so understanding. He's a nice man. And so we always have him strategically placed in our pageants or in our crush scenes, right up next to the Holy Child. He never says one word, but he has a clear, he is a clear sign of presence, protection. But if that's all he is, we have missed the point of his being there and his story. The deeper message here has little to do with the fact that Joseph went against the grain a little and followed his big heart by wishing to divorce Mary quietly. The thought of actually marrying her after he got the news was not in the cards for him whatsoever. It was a done deal. 
That is, until his life got turned upside down in a dream. Joseph was a man living in a world dominated by men and men's rules. A man in those days could divorce a wife for burning his breakfast. And if he put her out in the street and she didn't have other family to take her in, she would be in severe trouble, either begging or becoming a prostitute. Not many options open. But she could not divorce him for cruelty or for brutality. The worst thing that could happen to a man in that culture would be for him to be publicly shamed. And so punishment for a perpetually rebellious son or a pregnant woman without benefit of marriage was usually swift and harsh. A man who did not honor this men's code would be marginalized by the men. He would be seen as weak and would never be looked to for leadership. He too would be seen as damaged goods. In a small village, that was essentially a life sentence. It was too much to ask any reasonable man to believe that his betrothed had become pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was going to move on. But then everything changes. Joseph has a powerful dream. We've all had dreams, nightmares that wake us up, we tremble. Sometimes we can't make sense out of them, and other times we can make all too much sense out of them. But in this dream, it was clear, an angel appeared to him and told him not to put Mary out, that she was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. This child is special, and that he was to make her his wife and to name the child Jesus. See, that was the father's job to name the child. So the angel's telling him, you uh, are going to function as this boy's father. And I want you to do that. A miracle of miracles, Joseph does exactly what he was told to do. We're not told why, and we can just brush it off, but I don't want to. There's too much going on here. Because this is the last thing in the world that he would want to do. The last thing in the world we would expect him to do. See, and that's always a key indicator that the Holy Spirit's involved. When someone acts, not in a bad way, in a good way, but out of character. I never knew he could be so generous. I never knew he could let go of that grudge. You know, maybe there's a Holy Spirit going, uh, movement here going on because he couldn't do that all by himself. Joseph shouldn't be honored and remembered primarily because he was a nice guy or a protective husband and father. Those are important, but they're not enough. But those things aren't unusual. Instead, he should be lifted up as someone who listened to God in prayer when the message came and rattled him. And then he obeyed it, knowing that it would cost him big time in his community. Small town, people don't forget. It sounds a lot like the spirit of Jesus to me because Jesus' spirit was always disruptive. So that's why I declare that for me, Joseph is the first wise man. He's not supplanting one of the three magi. He's just ahead of them in line because he's the ideal model of what discipleship means, of how to say, I want to follow Jesus or I want to be a follower of God. We ask a lot of things of God, but when God asks us to do something, it usually makes us flinch first. You could say that if God isn't making you gulp, you aren't listening. This fits with the biblical model. We consider Abraham the father of the Jewish people and the Palestinians. But Jacob's the one who was the father of the 12 sons who became the leaders of the 12 tribes. But God speaks to him and says, I want you to be, in a sense, the father of my new people. And Jacob is right at that time, right in the middle of running away from his angry brother Esau because he has just manipulated things and tricked his brother and gotten the blessing from his father. And he's running away to another land to live with Uncle Laban. And he stays for years. I don't know if he always thought about that dream he had where God said, you're going to come back someday. He didn't want to come back. 
And so Jacob is not really what we would say a noble candidate to be God's person, but he was. He did it. And then there's Moses. God says, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let your people go. And Moses says, right. Pharaoh's the most powerful man in the world. I'm a nobody. He'll crush me like a bug. Who am I to speak to him? God says, I'll, and, and, and Moses says, I can't talk well. I'll give you words. Trust me. See, that's the key. Trust me. Eventually, Moses does it. He leads his people through Sinai for years and leads them into the promised land, to the edge of the promised land, and then he dies. But he did it. He did the last thing in the world he wanted to do. God made him gulp. God calls all of us to do big things that make us flinch, demanding, frightening, inconvenient. And most of the time, we let them pass with barely a second thought, or we dismiss them outright. I'm not qualified to do that. I've got too many other important things to do. Or do you have any idea what I'll have to give up if I do what you ask? Of course, God has every idea of what you'll have to give up. I can only imagine Joseph's argument with the angel. You can't ask me to take her as my wife, not now. What are the neighbors going to say? I trusted her. Now she's been unfaithful. My life in Nazareth will end if I marry her. I will be an outcast. I would rather die. We don't know what he said, but I'm just guessing. Something like that. But suddenly we hear he does it. Most of us find it hard to find the strength of the courage to do the right thing for the right reason all on our own. We need help. The clearest signs of God's presence are to be found in outrageous behavior by God's people. That is, outrageously compassionate and courageous behavior that makes other people take notice. Like the, they said about the early Christians in the first centuries, look at those Christians, how they love one another. It was an uncommon sense of love and commitment, and they did it because of their faith, their connection with the sacred one. About 30 odd years after this experience, Joseph, Mary, and the angel, Jesus had a very interesting encounter as recorded in the eighth chapter of John. You will remember it. A group of angry men come to him to test him, and they have a woman who's been caught in the act of adultery, and they all have stones, and they say, the law says we shall stone her, and they're ready to throw the stones, and you know what he says. Let, you, let the one without sin cast the first stone. Thank God none of them were so stupid or so arrogant as to say, well, that means me. Every one of them knew that they were not guiltless. And so they threw down their stones, they mumbled and grumbled, and they went away mumbling. And my reflection is, like father, like son. Amen.